Welcome, Pastor Jim, live on location. And uh, I've got my COVID test. I had two of them, and I flunked both of them, and I'm glad. I had pneumonia for a few weeks, and I was uh, down for the count a little bit, but I'm back and feeling great. It's really good to be back with everybody. I really missed doing uh, the devotion over the last few weeks, but we're getting back on track, and I hope everybody's doing well. I just got this 10-year anniversary shirt from the Meeting Place Church, uh, Reverend Bob Willard, uh, in Cleveland, Outreach Church, and Bob, thanks. So I'm wearing it today in honor of uh, Bob Willard, our men's group here at uh, Lakeshore Assembly, supports Bob Willard's outreach in Cleveland, and they're doing a wonderful work at the Meeting Place Church. Lots happening out there. And uh, um, some Wednesday, I'll take some time and we'll catch up a little bit on uh, what's happening in Cleveland? The Lord's moving mightily in Cleveland. Well, uh, we're ready for another snowmageddon tomorrow for Christmas Eve. And um, God bless. We're, we're glad uh, you're all here today. Today I want to talk about Mary who. And uh, um, let's open our Bibles, if we would, to Luke 1, 46 to 49. I have the key verses over there. First of all, I want to show you some cool gifts I've gotten for Christmas. And uh, it's really important to get gifts that really mean a lot. And Sharon Naso got me this. Look at fried chicken erasers. Check this out. <laughs> These things look so real. I'm afraid to bring them home because the grandkids are going to eat them. I just know they will. And uh, they look more real than real. I'm telling you, put honey on those things. You could suck on them for a while. But uh, And then I also got... I'm ready to go in case we get snowed in here for Christmas Eve. I've got my cheese balls. I got my peeps. And uh, Ernie and Allison bought me a new Charlie Brown Christmas tree. So we're, uh, we're ready for the holidays here, aren't we? But, uh, boy, God bless. I've really missed everybody. Missed church for two weeks. And for me, that's a long time. And uh, my assistant pastor uh, uh, and Murray Brown from Teen Challenge, uh, ministered while I was gone, did a wonderful job. Uh, church is doing great. Um, hate to tell you, this COVID year has not been a disaster here. We've, we've really had a, a really good year here. It would have been a lot better, obviously, without COVID, but I am really amazed at how uh, the body of Christ has just kicked up, and, and it just amazes me how faithful um, the people are that God has given me to pastor. I'm, I'm just uh, humbled by that. Well, let's go, if we could, to Luke chapter 1 and uh, Mary's song. This Sunday I did a sermon about uh, all the singing that was going on during the time of uh, the birth of Christ. And Mary's song is, of course, Mary's, um, it, it's, it's a literally, it's a, it's, a, it's a song that was in response when she was greeted by Elizabeth. She went to see Elizabeth, who was pregnant, of course, with John the Baptist. And Mary, I don't think we can comprehend how weird it must have been for a shy, humble, submissive, uh, little teenage girl for an angel to come and to communicate her that, you know, you're going to have a baby. You d you've never known a man, but you're going to have a baby anyway. And um, just the... Just the whole concept, the whole idea. Um, you know, today with, with all the computerization, with all the technologies, uh, things that sounded impossible before don't sound as impossible now. But when you think about back 2,000 years ago, how archaic everything was, and for th this idea that somehow she's going to uh, bring... A Messiah or a son of God into the world I mean the whole thing is just so far out and, and if you think about it why would God do that why wouldn't God just I don't know like Christ could just could have he could have he could have descended down uh, like he's gonna come back the second time he could have come the first time that way but God saw fit that that he would become one of us to communicate with all of us and to die 
for all of us. Isn't that cool? I think that's just amazing. Well, anyhow, Mary, Mary sung. I want to read just uh, verse 46 through 48. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. We need to understand that Mary, no matter how humble she was, no matter how um, prudent she was, no matter how virtuous she was, she, like every person, it has sinned. It's not that she, quote, lived in sin, but she had sin. We all have sin. And here, the first thing she glorifies is God her Savior. I think that's awesome. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. And by now, she's had time to, I guess, mentally and in her heart allow, to some degree, this reality to ferment of, of what is taking place. Did she have the whole scope of it? Of course she didn't. But up to this point, I think it's starting to sink in that something absolutely astounding and amazing is happening. And that Mary would, uh, would be used in a way that we can't even comprehend. Now, I want to share a few verses in a few minutes, but first of all, she said, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And, and I think, I don't know about you, I remember when I first got saved, I was a shoe repairman, uh, graduated from middle high school in 73, and immediately took over managing our family shoe repair business with my dad. Uh, we had no family or clergy directly in our family. Um, so the idea of me going into the ministry, and I remember how insecure I felt when I first came to Christ because I knew I wanted to kind of go in, in the direction of being in the ministry. And it just like all the ministers I was around, their dads were ministers, their uncles were ministers, their brothers were ministers, their grandpas were ministers, and my dad's a shoemaker. And I just remember how insecure I felt in those early years, right, Lise? We, we felt really insecure because we just, we just felt like we don't qualify. We're not smart enough. We don't, you know, we don't have uh, as much of, quote, the religious background as uh, other people that are being used in the ministry or in the ministry. Our, our concept was that everybody um, that's going to be really used properly in the ministry, or they're all going to have um, divin doctorates of divinities. They're all going to be from... Uh, well-bred families, uh, generations of preachers and pastors, and 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 here we come uh, out of the shoe shop uh, into the ministry. And we need to understand that uh, God uses everybody. First of all, if you have a background of uh, where you have relatives in the ministry, uh, that's a wonderful thing. So you have I believe you have a head start in, in some of the process because if you've been raised in the ways of the Lord, then if there's a true calling upon your life, all the better. But Mary hits on something here in verse 48 that really applies to nearly all of us that are watching today. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And God is mindful of your humble state as well. And when we think of serving God, ultimately we, we always think we want to do something great. Isn't that true? But let's look at a few verses before I get ahead of myself. Let's go to James 4.10. Do you have your Bibles? James 4.10. James 4.10. It says this, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And I believe that the concept of Humility, the idea of lifting you up is, I believe it's multi-dimensional multi in that, yes, you personally are lifted up in the Lord in the sense that, that once we are truly saved, once we've truly come to Christ, the, believe it or not, we are actually in ascension in Christ while we're here. We don't have to die to, to be with Christ in, in heaven. In spirit, we are already with Christ. That's cool. So when the Bible says he'll lift you up, we already, in essence, are lifted up. I'm no longer destined for hell below. I am destined for heaven above. So it makes sense, then, that the closer we get to God, obviously, the concept is we, we are, <laughs> we're lifted up. 
We're lifted up also in the sense that, that you, if you're trusting Christ and you're attempting to love him and serve him, that you can be encouraged each and every single day. I've had a really fun morning because I've had um, several people call me this morning and uh, people just talking about it. We have a gal in my church, her name's Cherise, and she just gave her heart to the Lord a few months ago and she had a really, really rough past, a, a rough upbringing, um, a lot of disaster in her life, and she was just telling me she can't, she's overwhelmed at how amazing her life is now. And she just can't believe it, that that life is so precious now. We're just a, a matter of months ago, and especially years ago, she thought everything was over. And now she finds out that things are just beginning. And in faith, that's what faith does. When And, and it, you know, the, the hope of Christmas is really not the Christmas spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. So you need to understand that the, the hope of Christmas, I was talking about Sunday in the message, wouldn't it be amazing if everybody in our culture, if all of you, if you go into January and you, you keep locked in uh, to the way you felt in the beginning of December going towards Christmas, what if we all year long uh, attempted to show the love of Christ, attempted to do charitable work, uh, work keep track of people, um, you know, find somebody with a need and meet the need. Folks, those are things we can do all year long. And in all reality, those are things that true Bible churches attempt to do all year long. Um, we celebrate the holidays here, but to be fair with you, we're not into holiday. I don't believe a holiday is really better than any other time. I believe every day is, this is the day that the Lord has given me, and uh, I will rejoice and be glad in it. So what if we lived for the Lord all year round? I'm just saying, what, what if we had the Christmas spirit all year round? Well, I believe one reason that people don't have the Christmas spirit is because if you don't really have the Holy Spirit, you can't do it. You know, for a few weeks in your own kind of self-power, you try to be nice, and then by January, you're fed up with everything and you go back to kind of normal. But the Holy Spirit uh, allows us to have that love and to actually grow in the concept of the spirit of Christmas in January, February, March, April, May, and on. So uh, first Peter, uh, I love I love it in James 4.10 rather when it says, humble yourselves before the Lord, he will lift you up. Then in first Peter 5.5, 5, if you'd open your Bible to that, first Peter 5.5. 5. And there's a really neat teaching here. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes, opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Now, it's been my experience as I'm attempting to continue to grow in Christ. I got saved 49 years ago, um, December 2nd. 2001 will be my uh, 50th anniversary of committing my life to Christ and being called into the ministry. 50 years. It's unbelievable. I just, I can't believe I'm, I'm saying those, those words. But the Bible says, in the same way you that are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. And there's, um, I remember when I first came to Christ and uh, when, I find, when I found people that had known the Lord for years, and I was just a, a, a babe in Christ. In, in so many ways, I thought I knew so much, and yet, like anything, it, it's, it's almost like a little, take a little kid. Uh, I used to te uh, coach a t-ball uh, baseball team many years ago when my kids were little. Oh, man, that was an experience because I don't know anything about baseball. But I'll never forget, we put the ball on the tee, and these little teeny kids, the helmets were so big, it covered their face, they barely could see the ball on the tee. And I just remember when these kids hit the ball and ran to first base, they thought they were major leaguers. And when they could get the ball beyond second base, it was like, it was a big deal uh, to some of those uh, little kids. And I believe in the spirit realm, it's no different. When somebody first comes to Christ, and hate to say it, in one way, you're, you're just hitting balls off the tee at first. Um, but as we grow in Christ, 
let's be honest, the, the length of the field expands. The length of, of God's purpose, his, his dimension of what he has for you expands. And that's why the Bible says, you that are younger, submit yourselves to the elders so that we don't think that we know so much. And I remember the good old days when I thought that I knew a whole lot. You know what I mean? I remember when my mom and dad used to sit at home and, and I every night I'm out, you know, driving around doing things. And I remember leaving the house feeling bad for my mom and dad that they were just sitting in the living room. And uh, now I know what they're talking about. I love to just sit in the living room. <laughs> I, I thought there was something wrong with them. No, there was something right with them. And the, the point is, we can't get cocky. And that's the part of humility. Humility doesn't devalue what God's doing in your life. It's simply, it's simply uh, you're able, in humility, you're able to put things in their proper setting. If, if you're going to do something wonderful for the Lord, fine. But without humility, God can't get the glory. There are things that you can do for God, and you might be able to do it really well. And in fact, you might be better than everybody. And you know what? That might not matter at all. It might, because you see, the, the world doesn't have to judge what you're doing. I wrote this down, um, that uh, um, great things for God aren't, aren't measured by cultural methodology. I've had to learn as a pastor, it doesn't matter if I have a big box church or a little church. All that matters is that I pastor the people that God gives me. That's all that matters. I'm not in competition with anybody else, and nobody should be in competition with me. When I was a younger man, I struggled with, with that. Uh, you know, I always thought that, that everything had to be bigger and better. Now I realize, no, I'll, I'll, I'm after best now. I'm really not after bigger. I'm after best. I want whatever we do to have that fingerprint of authenticity. I want there to be um, a sense of the Holy Spirit uh, in, in this ministry. Um, I, I just, I, when it's all said and done, I just want to be obedient. I don't want to really do great things anymore. I just want to be, I just want to be faithful till I go home to be with the Lord. And I believe it, I hope it's going to be a long time from now. I'm confident it will be. So God warns us here that, that, uh, we are to submit ourselves to the elders, clothe ourselves in humility towards one another because God oppose, opposes the proud but he shows favor to the humble. So if you will be humble, then God's with you. It doesn't matter if you have a ministry title or not. It doesn't matter if anybody even knows you have a ministry. It doesn't matter if anybody knows that what you're doing for the Lord is something of great substance and sacrifice to you. Everybody in the world doesn't have to know everything you're doing. And um, I was thinking about this. You want to do something great for God? Do this. Forgive somebody. Think of somebody that you struggle with forgiving. Forgive them. Forgive them. I have experienced the forgiveness of God for myself from God. And I have, at times, God has really given me the grace to forgive some people that I think have really, really hurt me. And the, the, the hardest thing to forgive was to, to, quote, forgive myself. In other words, not just that God has forgiven me for the sins that I have committed, but that I would even forgive myself for my own uh, failures, my own stuff. You know, we get to a place in life where you realize, like, man, it is by the grace of God that you're saved. Isn't that true? And so forgive someone else, and then forgive yourself. You know, if you're coming into this Christmas and you're not forgiving yourself, Man, you're missing the whole story. The whole reason Jesus came was to die on the cross and forgive us. To die on the cross and forgive us. The whole, um, I often preach about this, about emptiness. I love emptiness. I think the Bible, some of the, some of the emptiness in the Bible is overwhelming. There's an empty cradle, there's an empty cross, and there's an empty grave. Because Jesus is no longer there. But it all started, obviously, that humble night when Jesus came forth um, in a cradle of some um, rugged, industrial 
type. Um, Jesus didn't come into the world in a Ramada Inn, my friends. He didn't. He didn't come in in a palace. He he came in the most humblest of circumstances. And um, be kinder to those. I thought of this one too. Be kinder to those that irritate you. How many have somebody that irritates them? Okay. Um, be kind to someone that irritates you. Just show extra love to them. I'm expecting to get hundreds of phone calls and texts after this. I know everybody's going to be nicer to me. But be kinder to those that irritate you. Honestly, I'm working on that. I, there's, I'm, I irritate people. People irritate me. And I really want to show more of the love of Christ. I don't know why. I've just had a, a, a sense of God's love and his mercy recently that um, it, I'm a little overwhelmed at how much the Lord has blessed my life. When it's all said and done, whether we've really loved each other is all that's really going to be the measure. How perfect I preach, how perfect you sing or do what you do for the Lord. Um, I want you to do it with excellence. I want you to do it to the best of your ability. But ultimately, um, ultimately this, this isn't uh, a talent contest. Ultimately, it's um, not even a contest. Ultimately, it's what is in your heart and um, have you executed and have you given to God the best that you have to give? And have you done it with all the strength and energy you can muster? Well, we're going to close in prayer, but it's a pleasure to be back and I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, this devotion today. And uh, God bless Bob Willard and the gang down at the Meeting Place Church. Hallelujah. Thanks for the shirt. And uh, uh, I didn't have any Christmas uh, colors to wear today. I don't have a red, I don't even have, a, I don't even have an ugly Christmas uh, sweater. I was going to wear a red, something red today. So this came in the mail, believe it or not. Maybe you didn't get what you were supposed to get, but I got what I got. So thanks, Bob, in Cleveland for sending me the shirt. And let's pray. Father, we want to thank you and praise you as we enter into this Christmas. And God, it's... Christmas is only significant if we place the significance not upon a day, not upon a holiday, not upon um, much of the cultural trappings. Christmas is only significant when we understand how amazing it is, Jesus, that you came into the world at all and that you came into the world for me and every single person that's listening to this devotion. Help us to come to you Turn from our wicked way, repent of our sin. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts and live in us. I don't want the Christmas spirit. I want the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Christmas. I will see you next Wednesday, um, 1 o'clock. Next Wednesday, 1 p.m. God bless. Have a great Christmas.